goes. Okay. Let's uh, refresh a little bit about distributed memory computing. So here I have a, a, a list uh, basically following roughly the historic appearance of each of these architectures of this HPC. HPC means high performance computing. Uh, you could call it like a supercomputer as well, right? And here's just a, a roughly, roughly a historical uh, order of how these uh, machines came to life, right? From the dead, that is basically the vector machines to the current modern HPC clusters that are hybrid machines. So the vector machines were built like in, maybe in the 60s or 70s. And the main idea was to um, put a lot of arithmetic units, uh, logical uh, and arithmetic units on the processor, right? Such that you could send a, a very single one instruction to be applied on a long array of one dimensional uh, data, right? Contiguous one dimensional data that is called a vector, right? So those machines were the, the, the granddaddy of the, of the current machines, right? And the companies that produced them was mostly like Cray and NAC. Uh, they still have some of them, but it's, they are very special purpose machines. And nowadays, what is left from those from that era, uh, just basically some is a fixed amount, fixed size vector units on the, on the, on the computer, on the CPU, right? Uh, that uh, you can you can run uh, that you can run uh, single instructions on a vector of, of data, right? For example, on Niagara we have the the instruction set called AVX five twelve that allows you to do to up to to apply the single instruction on a, on a vector of uh, five hundred twelve bits. Okay, uh, symmetric multiprocessor machines or shared memory machines uh, was basically somehow the, the next step, right? So Okay, we need more processing power. So how do we, we how do we increase that processing power? We just uh, jam more cores, jam more CPUs in the motherboard, right? So that's how it was initially uh, designed and, and it starts to grow. However, the complexity becomes larger and with the complexity, the cost becomes larger. So these machines uh, have a limited number of cores in, in nowadays. So they are present everywhere, of course, but you're not gonna see machines with an absurd uh, amount of cores because of the cost and the complexity of having this kind of machines. Uh, also, uh, another idea was, okay, why don't we um, attach to the, to the CPU, to the, the, the central, uh, um, to the central unit, central computation, the, the, com, the, com, the, the to the CPU uh, off-host uh, device, like accelerators, right? The idea is started with like co mathematical co-processing to accelerate math computations and so on. And nowadays the main device that you all uh, know about is the general purpose uh, GPU, the, the graphic processing unit, right? And, uh, and, but also it's not limited to that. We have this uh, cell, MIC and FPGA, the, the, the field programmable gate arrays that you can do very uh, specialized kind of programming on, on that CPU to adapt that CPU, to adapt that accelerator, that, that, that device to your problem, right? Instead of your problem trying to adapt to, this, to, the, to the device. So some companies that produce this kind of, of the device, NVIDIA, AMD, AMD, Intel, Xilinx, Altera, and so, and so on, right? And finally, we have uh, what is called the cluster or distributed memory machines. There is a, it's just a bunch of computers that you link together in a network, internet, you interconnect them, right? And there are some examples of the, the interconnect, um, like the GigaE, the InfiniBand, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Gemini and Iris from Cray, uh, the late BGQ uh, Toros from IBM, right? So usually those interconnect are very expensive and, and very fast. So that would distinguish uh, uh, the distributed memory machines from uh, uh, simply a cluster where you put some commodity computers together, right? However, uh, that's how it, it started. We basically buy some commodity uh, computers like the, and, and connect them together. And then there you go, each computer with their own memory. So it's a distributed memory machine, right? And, and then you can just, uh, 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 and, and then you can just use those computers at the same time, right? And that's basically what we're gonna learn today, how to do that. 
And of course, the hybrid machines are basically the heart of the modern HPC cluster. They're basically, it, it is just a combination of all of these past architectures. We have uh, vector units, uh, some, some of them have accelerators like GPU, some of them, most, uh, the vast majority, majority of them um, shared memory machines, share, share memory nodes, right? You have, uh, you have memories that has multi-core multi or multi-processors, right? And so, and that's basically uh, uh, the kind of machine that we have today. Uh, during the summer school, the virtual summer school, we, we are going to talk about distributed memory machine, how to program them. And we're going to talk about the shared memory machines, how to program them, I think in two weeks from now. Uh, but I, I think we're not going to talk about accelerators uh, uh, during the summer school. Later on, maybe in the next term, we are going to have some, some course on this. Okay. So what is so appealing about the cluster or the, or, or, or the supercomputer, right? It is just like very simple to, it's a very simple type of a parallel computer to build, right? You basically take some very powerful standalone computer as in this picture, right? And, and then you, you connect them together you, in a, and you form a network, right? So each computer in this network is a node in a, in a network, is a node in a graph, right? So it, usually we call this computer like computer nodes because of that, okay? Because they are connected in a network. So you, you form a graph and the, the cables are the leaves and the, computer, uh, the computers in this network are called the nodes, right? So and, uh, in this network of computers, uh, each node is independent, right? So the parallel code will consist only of uh, programs running on separate computers, communicating with each other, right? It could be very different uh, programs, but in this course, we're gonna use the same program. And, and each node has its own memory. So in this diagram here, I'm showing basically uh, each CPU, uh, like in, uh, what is this color? Sort of teal, uh, green. Okay, let's say green. The, the circle is represents the CPU or the core, right? Or if you wanna uh, be more generic in the distributed memory system, could be just the computer node, right? With the, with a bunch of CPUs and cores there. And what is more important is that each of these uh, CPUs have attached to them on this. Uh, red block that is a, the, a memory bank, right? It's a, it's a memory that that CPU uh, is attached to. So it could be like a, a, a Numa node, right? If you're talking about some sort of affinity of, of uh, the memory to the processor, in any case, it's just a pictographical way of representing uh, a cluster. In this case with four CPUs, right? So whenever one plus one CPU is doing some work, one task is doing some work on a CPU, right? You have doing some computations of a matrix row or something like that, right? And if it needs data that uh, it is from another region, let's say you have a row of matrix that is that belongs on, on the CPU too, right? So then you need to somehow request that data back into the CPU one, right? The usual model is by mass, uh, message passing. You, you basically you send a message uh, requesting the data and uh, the data is sent back to you uh, through a message. Okay, so the issue, that's the usual programming model. Uh, okay, in terms of hardware, as I said, um, a cluster is appealing because it's very easy to build, right? Uh, instead of having just like a monolithic, uh, gigantic machine, right? With uh, lots of CPUs all bunched together, jammed together, right? It's much easier to have a module, like, a, like one node, a computer node, and then you just connect them with cables, right? And it's very easy to expand as well. For example, Niagara expanded from 60,000 cores to 86,000 cores and without a major problem by just adding the computer nodes and recabling and that's it, right? Uh, it's very different if you had a monolithic machine and then you have to put all the uh, electronics uh, circuits, the boards and, and the components in the, that machine. I mean, no, it's a hell. It's not very, very easy to, to, to scale this kind of machines, right? But it is very easy to scale your message, uh, uh, di distributed memory machines, right? You just attach new computers together. Uh, software, <clears throat> every communication has to be hand-coded 
So usually it is harder to program than, than the, the kind of uh, parallel programming that you do when your, your software runs only on one, on one computer, right? Because you need to, ex to be explicit on where to, um, to, to send the data and where to receive the data from, right? And so usually it's hard to program. However, uh, the benefit, for example, of this course is that you, you might take this course just once and then work on your program. And once it is parallelized, it's basically done, right? The main idea of the main algorithm is there and you, you don't need to worry about your, your, uh, your program anymore. Of course, you can always fine tune here and there, but the main idea is gonna be there. The communication is gonna be there, debugged, and then you can just uh, run it in, in small clusters or big clusters as you wish. Okay, so that's somehow the advantage. You put in the work, but once the work is there, it's done. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Okay, it's high performance programming uh, model, like the parallel programming approaches, right? If you are lucky, for example, um, the, the, the parallelism that you are looking for is basically a, a parameter sweep, right? You basically are trying to run the same code, the same uh, serial code, over and over and over again for different parameters. And maybe at the end, do a little bit of a, a post-processing of that data, right? To, to get a solution that you're looking for. <clears throat> and those are embarrassingly parallel applications. Uh, and usually, uh, I mean, you can use a, a variety of languages like C, C++ or Fortran, like compiled language or Julia, that is like just in time comp compilation, right? Or you can use scripting languages like Bash and Python that are slower because they are interpreted languages. So the, the, the commands are basically uh, interpreted all, uh, line by line, right? Instead of optimizing the whole program to make it faster. So those are embarrassing parallel applications. You have done an exercise, uh, uh, an assignment on that uh, uh, last week with Ramses, right? And, and I'm not gonna talk much about this. Uh, of course, um, in shared memory systems, when you have uh, lots of cores, right? And the memory share, shared between those core, among those cores, right? You can uh, spawn threads such that each thread will do some computation using a particular core, right? Mostly uh, the, the most common one um, models are open in P and P threads, right? You can, you can have also heterogeneous computing, uh, like Ramses also mentioned last week, right? And for, and for example, you have to write a, a different set of commands such that it dispatch a different set of instructions to the off host accelerators for the GPU, for example. And then you have some examples like CUDA language, OpenCL, OpenACC, Open, and OpenNP most lately uh, uh, to help with, with that. We're not gonna talk about them. And of course, message passing, that is uh, basically the, the de facto default for distributed memory sy systems. That basically, you, you send messages back and forth, right? And, uh, and the library standard is called MPI, message pass interface. And that's the programming model that we are gonna talk today and, and discuss the, 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 the features, right? I should mention as well that is called there is a PGAS, a kind of um, uh, programming model for distributed memory, and it basically is like a partition the global address space. So it basically allows one computer to access a shared uh, address space on the other computer, right, directly. So it is an advantage. Some languages incorporated this kind of modeling. Like for example, UPC that is unified parallel C in Fortran 2008 that basically has the core array that you, you basically don't need to, to worry too much about how uh, um, you don't worry about the, the, the message passing business because it, it basically the, 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 the language allows you to access data on the other computer directly. Usually sometimes they, they have under the, the hood, they have some MPI, uh, uh, MPI uh, uh, library uh, dependencies, right? And of course, in, on the on the on the on this programming, these parallel approaches, uh, sometimes you have a hybrid combinations of, of all of the above, right? The most common one is to have uh, uh, MPI with OpenMP, so you take advantage of uh, the uh, fine-grained parallelization on 
inside one node, right? That is open in P is good for that. And you, you in advantage of a uh, um, coarse grain parallelization that you, you can use MPI to distribute your, your parallelization, your, your, your computation load across different computer nodes, right? We will focus on this lecture on MPI <clears throat> programming. Okay. Let's see MPI basics. A any questions about uh, about this so far? Okay, don't see it. Okay. Okay. So the message pass interface. What is it? Okay. So before, uh, it, it is basically uh, a standard, right? It is ratified by the MPI forum. The MPI forum is basically a collection of different uh, uh, stakeholders, right? So you have uh, uh, vendors, you have uh, uh, researchers in, in parallel computing, you have uh, uh, developers of, of libraries, right? And they all come together. Uh, uh, they all came together in the past, I think in 1994, like it was the first version. Um, to try to standardize uh, the interface of how these messages are going to be passed back and forth. Because before you would have for each, each hardware, each piece of hardware, the vendor would come up with a private library that would do that for you. So your code would not be portable from one cluster to the another. So the whole idea was to improve uh, <clears throat> to improve the portability of uh, parallel codes, right? The, then they come up with this standard library interface. And, and, <clears throat> and, and that standard, of course, evolved with time. So the first versions uh, was just basically send and receive and make some collectives, right? And then the second version, they had to do some disambiguation. They have to to uh, have other options of the send and receive, right? The third version, they introduced the concepts of um, the second and third version, for example, they introduced concept of, concepts of PGAS, right? The, the, uh, that you have some sort of like one-sided communication that you could access memory on the other node uh, without the other computer uh, having to recognize this through messages, right? And so on. And version four is still under development, and it is, I think, the most expected uh, development from my point of view is some sort of a resilience upon crashes, right? Sometimes, the, uh, if there is an error in the library, basically your your code either hangs there forever or it crashes, right? So there's not much of re resilience of dealing with these errors and 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 um, and um, shutting down smoothly or. or restarting smoothly, right? Grace, gracefully. So this is still under development. So that's the interface, the, the, the standard library interface, how these messages uh, interface uh, are used to pass messages, right? Of course, there are several MPI implementations. Uh, the most true important one that is, is worth mentioning is the open MPI that we have on our clusters. And you, you just can load them with model load GCC, open MPI, GCC is the compiler. You could use also the Intel compiler instead. Um, and you have the MPH2 that is basically used by uh, the vendor, in, in our case, Intel, right? To, um, to, to optimize for the, for, the, for the hardware, right? So you could uh, load this model by using the, in, uh, the Intel MPI uh, model. That is basically uh, optimi fine tuned, optimized version of MPH2. But OpenPI is very good, and we're going to stick with this uh, during this class. So, MPI is a library for message passing. It is not part of the compiler. So, you're going to see several function calls that can be made from any compiler or any or many languages, right? All you have to do is to link uh, your code. Uh, to the library, to the MPI library, right? And to help you with that, there are some uh, compiler wrappers called MPI CC for, for C, MPI F90 for Fortran, MPI CXX for C++, okay? So here's an example of the Hello World, um, Hello World um, uh, program in, in, with MPI um, uh, function calls, right? As you can see, 
the MPI in it, MPI com size, MPI com rank. So this is in the C language, and this is in the Fortran language. And we are going to go in more details uh, in a moment on how it works. So basically, uh, when, when the computer the computer needs data from one one call from one node to the other, right? It, it needs to to use uh, um, it needs to communicate with that code, and this communication is done by sending and receiving messages from one node from one one node to the other through the, the tasks, right? And each message involves a function call from each of the of the programs, okay? So basically, if you, you have to, if you need information that is being computed or, or stored on this, on this uh, CPU, you need to send a message that it needs that. That CPU also needs to recognize that it is receiving that message, right? And then send back information for that, for example, right? So the library uh, has basically three, basic sets of functionality. The first thing is, is the pairwise communications that are done uh, via messages, as I just mentioned, right? One, one, one task running on this CPU, uh, send a message to another task running on that CPU. So it's a point to point, right? So it's a pairwise, it's a pair of, of, uh, of tasks that are communicating, right? So the library uh, allows, uh, provides this kind of functionality. Also collective operations through messages. So instead of just uh, two participating, uh, two, two members part to participate in the, in the communication, a collective will require that all of them participate in the communication, right? Uh, another, another functionality is uh, by providing efficient routines to get data from memory into messages and vice versa. So this is very useful both to, to send messages around from one computer to the other, but also to write those messages uh, in efficient way to disk, right? So you can do input and output or IO with, this, with these MPI routines. And I think we, we might talk about this uh, later on Friday if, if I have time. Okay, so the key of this message passing interface is of course the messages, right? It's gonna send a message. What is this message and what does it require? The first thing that we need to know is that, okay, a message needs a sender and a receiver, right? And how do we specify this? Do I need to specify the sender? No, usually not because the sender is the one that is running the, co the command, right? However, the receiver usually need to specify, okay, am I sending this message to which process or to which task, right? And also, uh, as a quirk, let's say, of, 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 this, uh, of this library, of the, of the message pass interface, uh, when you send a message, that message needs to be received actively by the receiving process. So the receiving process needs to be expecting to, to receive that message in order to this kind of communication to work, okay? Uh, and what are these messages, right? The messages, the MPI messages are just a, a bunch of string of length count. So you basically uh, contiguously put uh, several MPI types one by, side by side, basically, and, and count times, basically, it's like that, right? So this string of, of, uh, of length count of some MPI type could be a string of, of letters. So you would have basically uh, words and sentences, right? For example, it could be a string of integers that could represent a one dimensional array, for example, or double or floating point uh, numbers and so on, right? So the basic MPI, MPI provides basic MPI types, right? For integers, floating numbers and so on. And of course you can build uh, more complex MPI types. We might talk about this on Friday, uh, but basically that's what a message is. Just a string of some fixed number of MPI types, right? And also you can associate with this uh, message a tag to help identify that 
that message because one CPU could be sending several messages to the same, same other CPU and those messages might not arrive in order. And in order to help you organize and, and pair those messages with the, the receiving CPU, a tag can be very useful. We are not gonna use uh, any example with different tags, but it is, it is useful to, to, to do bookkeeping of these messages. The size of MPI library, it's becoming huge. I think indeed I should upgrade, uh, update this slide. It's not greater than 200. It might, it might be already greater than 500 or so. Uh, however, the, the, the number of concepts is not that big. So basically we can start with 10 or 12 uh, different uh, uh, MPI uh, functions and use more as needed and, 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 and so on. And why it is so big, it's, it is because for each concept, you end up with several different functions that will have different behaviors, different expected uh, behaviors uh, for the same kind of concept, okay? So, but you shouldn't worry, we're gonna use just a few of them. Okay, so here is the time that I want you to uh, slow down and uh, try to access our Signet Teach cluster. Okay. Uh, okay, the Teach cluster, as Ramsa said, is just uh, what is left from our previous cluster called GPC uh, system. And I think we have like 42 nodes and uh, we, we, <clears throat> we, they are assigned for education and training, right? So each of, with each of you, have a login name for the, to, to access these clusters is uh, LCL and the score U of T 2021 SS. And this NNNN is the number that is assigned to you. If I'm not wrong, let me check here. You come here on the, on the, on the course site, right? And you go to login info, and then you can find this information about uh, which number it is yours. Once you have that, you can uh, log in to, into the teacher cluster by typing SSH-Y and then your login name, replace the NNNN with your number that you got there at teach.signet.utoronto.ca. Teach okay, I'd like to, to see everybody uh, connecting there. This dash Y is just to forward your, 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 your graphics connection. So it's not essential if you're not working with graphics, um, but for this, for this class, let's, let's use it because we are gonna use graphics just once. And, and so I suggest you to, to put this option dash Y. So connect to your account on Teach, and then you're gonna CD to dollar scratch, and then you're gonna copy uh, the course material with the examples and assignments from Signet course SS 2021 for underscore MPI dot. That should be on your scratch. Once you, okay. I wanna know if everybody is connecting. Were you able to connect? Oh, sorry, the chat didn't come up for me. It's strange. No, I, I see there are some. Uh... Okay. Yes, if you, if you guys got an error, say uh, permission denied, that is expected. Those are the solution of the exercises. Just uh, take note of those uh, files that you, you, you are not able to copy. And on Friday, after we review um, the assignment, I will change the permissions. And so you can read them and copy them. Okay.
Okay, so, and once you, you have uh, uh, connect to the cluster, I, yes, those are the solutions, okay? So just write down and on Friday we come back to them and then you can, you can have access to the solutions. Okay, so I am on the teach cluster. And now I have already copied my stuff there. I can go to my scratch for MPI. And then I can do source setup. Okay, so the source setup is just uh, load the models that we are gonna need. That is basically the default models on the teach cluster, the default compiler, GCC, the default uh, MPI library implementation that is called an open PI and some graphics uh, utilities for, for later on. Okay, so always remember to source that file the first time you use that. Yes, yes, Pranav, you, you have, uh, I think, four or five of them. Those are the, the, sorry, I get this kind of CP overwrite. Oh, you're probably copying twice. You're copying twice. You, you already have that, that cop. Did you take this course last year or, or did you take my intro to MPI? A lot of material overlaps with, with that. Okay. So how are we doing? Yes, the permission denied is for uh, the solutions. I think you have four or five of them that it, has uh, has the solution to the, the to the assignment, and those you don't have permission to co-op yet. Only on Friday. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So to run uh, your computation, so I hope everybody got this uh, set up. If you don't, uh, bug uh, Ramses, uh, Marcelo, or Yoha in the chat, they can help you out. And if it is still a problem, we can see this after the class. So as Ramses mentioned last week, uh, uh, most supercomputer needs a scheduler to, to schedule the jobs in terms of the priority that each job has on the resources that are available at the moment, right? So it, 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 it governs the allocation of the resource. This, mean you, you, this means you, you submit a job with a job script. On the other hand, this, this, uh, this class, we're gonna use a command called srun that basically does uh, two things at the same time. It allocates the resource that you're requesting plus run and run the job uh, that you, uh, and run the command on that job, okay? All in one. Um, so basically we have 34 nodes with 16 calls uh, per node and you should, it should start almost immediately. I, I don't think you're gonna have uh, too much competition, but sometimes you need to wait a little bit because there, there might be many people trying to do the same thing at the same time on the cluster, and then you have to wait a little bit. But I, I, I suspect uh, 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 the cluster is empty not today. Okay, so we are gonna start on the hello, with a hello world example. So you're basically gonna go to the starting point, uh, CD4 MPI, MPI intro, and then we're gonna compile and run it uh, together. Okay, so here you have an example of the hello world for, for C and the hello world for Fortran. Okay, I will just show quickly. So MPI intro, I have already compiled them to save me time. And if I do hello world C, I'm running the C version here with just one task. Oops. And then I see hello world from task zero out of one. Okay. 
But if I want to run eight of them, you're going to have that. Okay. So usually I wait for everybody to do this in the in person lecture, but uh, we are in a virtual one, and this lecture is a little bit condensed. We have a chance to go back on this later on on Wednesday, but if you don't, please go over them, compile, and run them together, okay? So the first question you might ask is that what MPI F90 and what MPI CC uh, are, are doing, right? Well, they are just compiler wrappers to facilitate your life. If you type like MPI CC and show, show me option, when you're compiling that, it's gonna show you that it's using under the hood, the compiler, right? And a bunch of, uh, um, a bunch of include include and linking in, in, in library link library paths <clears throat> for the linker for the for the loader that you need to include in your executable for you. So instead of you finding out each each of these lines here, each of these clauses that you need to to build your program, right? Uh, the the NPICC already find out for you and just link for you, so you don't need to worry about. It. So you find the paths that you need. Where, where the libraries are, where the header files of the libraries are, and, uh, and link those libraries for you, okay? And sorry, and include that in the command line so the compiler can uh, compile and link those libraries for you when you're building the executable, okay? So if you have questions, please ask. Let me see here if there's any questions about this. Okay, so fine. Now you have your MPI program compiled and you wanna use MPI run or S run, right? What, what, do, what do they do? Okay, so they basically they launch uh, the number of process that you are asking for and assign uh, each of those process an MPI rank and start the program that uh, you have in your, in your command line, okay? So in, in, in our case here, so if I have asked for eight processes, it, it will just assign a, a, a rank for each of those processes and start eight instances of this uh, hello world C command line on your, on your computer, okay? So MPI, uh, okay, for multi-node run, you have to have a, li a list of nodes in, uh, in old clusters, usually the MPI run will just SSH to each node and launch the program. Nowadays with the modern schedule, uh, the schedule does that for you. It, it launches the, the uh, MPI run on each of the nodes for you uh, with the tasks that you ask for, okay? And if you only use MPI run, it will uh, run uh, the process on the login node and will not allocate any resource. So usually you, you use MPI run inside a batch job. S run on the other hand is part of the schedule. We use the slum on, on Niagara and the teach cluster. And it, in, it uh, not only uh, launch the process, but it also allocate the resources. It finds what, which nodes are free and use them to launch the process there. And this is what we're gonna use in this class uh, during this week. So you had an experience last week with SPatch. This is gonna be a little bit simpler. I'm just gonna use SRun to run the, 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 the commands uh, for you on the, on, the, on the cluster. So uh, uh, a few words about the number of processes. The number of process uh, to use uh, most of the time is going to be equal to the number of processes, uh, processors in, in a node, right? Um, the processor in the node here, it is basically uh, most of the time the uh, the physical core of the of the CPU, right? But not necessarily, right? If you are doing hyper threading. So you have multiple cores per physical, multiple process per physical uh, core, right? So all how the operating system see, sometimes you have one physical core with the operating system sees as a two logical cores, for example, Niagara, right? We don't have that on Teach. Uh, sometimes you have a memory hungry uh, application. So you have 
to use less processes than uh, cores on a node. For example, for Niagara, if you need to use more than four gigabyte uh, per process. And sometimes you have a hybrid, uh, uh, a hybrid model, right? You're trying to minimize the number of MPI tasks by adding um, uh, a threaded uh, uh, programming model, right? And so usually you need uh, less process per core, uh, but multiple core, multiple threads per core. You usual one thread. Per, usually you have one thread per core, right? So how do you do this? If you have like a, a regular peer MPI uh, run on a 40 core node, for example, like it is on Niagara, right? You would ask for the number of nodes, one and the number of tasks, 40. So basically that's the usually what you do. If you wanna run on multiple nodes, you could uh, uh, you have to, to change both of, of these numbers, but also, also, you could use n tasks per node, so you, you don't need to change that number. Uh, Hyperthreaded MPI run uh, on Niagara, for example, you use uh, number of tasks equals to 80 because you can have two threads per uh, physical core, right? Or like one thread per logical core. Uh, and a memory hungry MPI run on a 40 core node requiring eight gigabytes per process. So you'd have to reduce the number of process there. So from 40 to 20. And a hybrid run when you use MPI uh, with threads. In this case, you have any processes, MPI processes. Each of them is gonna use uh, five threads. So you have five CPUs per task here. That's what the dash is uses. In this session, we are gonna use uh, only a, a small number of tasks. So we can drop in the, the N argument, the, the capital N, the number of nodes argument, and use only the small dash N argument. That is the number of tasks. So MPI uh, in S run runs any program uh, you can, the MPI run will start that process uh, launching uh, for any program, right? So uh, when it starts, it, it basically is the, the, the MPI uh, 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 runtime will set up uh, the, the, the rank of that program, right? Which task uh, each of those programs, each of those processes are. So for example, if, if you are on the teach, teach zero one, the login or teach zero one, and if you run MPI run there, it's gonna, it, it's gonna run on the teach, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, because it's not allocating the resource. But if you use S run, it is gonna allocate resource. In this case, the teach 02, that is a compute node, and it's gonna be run two tasks there of the command host name, okay? So host name doesn't know anything about MPI. In that environment, of course, sure. Uh, it, it could query the runtime library to see, hey, which task am I in this MPI uh, uh, environment, right? But it doesn't know, it just launches and executed and the, the output is just sent to the standard output. In this case, teach zero true, okay? So here at the example of the hello world, I think I have done that. Not all printing to, to the screen will print the, what is the, which task it is. So the label option is useful to tell you uh, which, uh, which task is printing what, right? And you see that it is out of order. It's uh, mostly because uh, the execution of each, each program in, in parallel doesn't finish exactly at the same time. And on top of that, to send that message back to you, it needs to go over the network. It, it is also not guarantee the order, right? Sometimes you can hop on another, on another switch and then it delays uh, the, the, the output to be sent to your terminal. And so the order is, is, uh, is random. Okay. So one, one more, uh, one analogy of what MPI and SRAN does that I like to, to, to say that a colleague of mine uh, came up with is basically uh, the SRAN, uh, the, the MPI run, it, it is like uh, uh, installing uh, telephone lines in your house, right? So if you imagine that 
each of your house is a computer node, let's say, a, a, or MPI, uh, where, where an MPI task is gonna run, right? And, and the setting the lines and give you the number is basically what MPI is, is giving. It, it gives uh, the, the, the number to the telephone that you, you're gonna have on, on your house, and it knows how many houses there are in your neighborhood, right? Okay. And, and, and then later on, I'm gonna talk a little bit more how the, the, the program initialized themselves. Okay, so make, um, we talk about uh, com uh, compiling and running, but sometimes you have uh, too many files to compile and co a compilation done file by file as it is done by make. I mean, remember that make is a utility with a bunch of uh, rules in, in, in explaining how to build the uh, object files and libraries and uh, executables uh, based on the source codes, right? So those rules are um, inherently most of the time serial, right? And some, uh, sometimes uh, those rules are not necessary, not necessarily serial. You could run that them in parallel in, in order to, to, to take advantage of that, you can use uh, the dash J options that will launch any processes uh, to compile your code in parallel, okay? So it's very useful. I mean, if you have uh, experience with very big, very large codes, uh, you could see that, uh, uh, that it can speed up con considerably, like a, a code that takes one hour and a half could compile in 10 minutes if you use this option. Okay, now let's go uh, a little bit into the details of what the, the code does. For example, in Fortran, when you have use MPI, uh, it's basically importing the declarations for the MPI function calls. MPI init is basically initialization of the MPI library. So in this case, if, if you continue with the analogy of the, the lines, it's basically MPI init just connect your handle, your, your telephone, your phone set, into the line, right? And now it knows how many phones are there and what is your phone number, basically. So now the MPI init knows how many uh, how many uh, tasks are in that in, in that communicator and what is the the rank or what is the what is the value that you have. Uh, the error returns any error code. MPI finalize, close up the stuff basically shut down the, the, these, these data structures and everything else. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about com rank and com size in a, in a bit. Let's take a look on the C. Uh, you have to include the MPI library uh, headers here on the, on, the, on the top of the command, right? And again, you use the MPI in each, initialize, and it must, be, it must come first, the first thing that always. And MPI finalize is the last thing that it should come. And the error is the MPI routine could return an error code, but as I, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, it is not very resilient. So your code could just hang in there or just crash. So you can use it or you, you, you could ignore it. Some, com some, some code does that, just ignore the, the error code. And what is the most important part is uh, what is called the communicator, right? A communicator is a handle to a group of processes that can communicate uh, with each other. So basically, a, a, this handle, if you have, um, if you have, uh, when when, you when the runtime starts, uh, it will start up or populate this data structure MPI com world that is the default communicator, and that will have all the tasks. Uh, it, 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 in your in, in your simulation in your program right and if if your code if your instance of your code wants to know uh, what is the, uh, the the rank or let's say what is the phone number let's say you basically need to take the, the handle and just ask right that's the the same as calling the MPI com rank to know what is the rank and calling the MPI com size to know what is the size of that communicator so let, let's understand a little bit more what this communicator means, right? So it, it groups the process into, into what is called communicator. 
And this commun communicator just defines a uh, communication uh, context. Uh, you, you can think of uh, the, the same analogy as, uh, for example, a directory and a file, right? I mean, I could have a file in different directories. So the directory gives me the, some sort of like a path to that file. It's a different context, di different location context, or maybe like a namespace in, in C++, right? That will allow you to have uh, functions with the same names, but in the different namespace, so they don't conflict each other. So the same, the same idea here for the communication, it is, uh, it is some sort of like a, a context, right? Where you define for this set of, uh, of, um, of processes, uh, <clears throat> uh, where you define this context for this set of processes, where they can communicate. So each communicator is going to have the size. The default size is all the tests, all the, 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 the number of processes that you are asking for, right? And each communicator has uh, a number of tasks. The number of tasks is, is, here is uh, represented by the size. Every task has a rank. So it's basically uh, an ID, an identification for that task. Uh, and uh, the rank varies from zero to size minus one. And every task in your program belongs to MPI com mode. That is the default communicator, as I said, okay? Okay, let me check if there is any question on this. Yeah. Does the label given by the label option of S1 always coincide with MPI process rank? Yes, it does. Okay, so the communicators uh, are very flexible. You start with the default MPI world, com world, right? But you can create your own, right? Depend on how you can, you, you organize the, the kind of communications that you need to do. Um, so you may break the tasks in, into subgroups and uh, sub, subgroup, subgroups and reorder them for some reason, right? For example, if we start with a, a communicator MPI com mode of size four, so you have four tasks, right? Four processes, right? And, and they are identified by the ranks from zero to three, right? As, as, I, see, as I show in this picture. But then you, you, you go into another part of the program that you need to reorganize uh, uh, the communication in order to, um, to do some other computations that doesn't have anything to do with the data that is, is, is at the moment for that particular uh, computation, right? So you, you create a new communicator and you, you could leave out one of the processes, for example, and then the size is three now and the ranks goes from zero to two but I can relabel them uh, the way that I want, okay? So I can reorder the tasks, okay? So usually, for example, a library would, would have a communicator, a, a library that uh, uses the MPI under, under the hood will, will, would have a communicator on their own, right? So they, 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 they don't need, so they don't interfere with the communication that the user using that library would have, right? So, is it clear the idea of the communicator? I mean, in this context of um, communication. Do you, do you initiate? No, you don't initiate MPI com word. The, the MPI run or will do that for you. The runtime library will do that for you. Okay. Then when you go with NPI init, and then NPI init is basically, um, it, it queries uh, the NPI run, runtime library. What is my communicator? And the communication, the communicator uh, MPI com mode will tell you the number of tasks and which task you are. And then if you want to know which task you are, you call the MPI com, com, com rank to know what is your rank, right? 
And if you want to know how many uh, uh, of you all are, so you call MPI comb size to get the size. Okay, I hope it is a little bit clearer. So the base, the, the main components of the communicator are the, the global communicator, the default one, MPI comb word. And then you have the MPI comb rank that it gets uh, the, the current task rank and the MPI comb size that is a function call to provide you the communicator size. Any, any questions about this? So basically we have uh, two main concepts uh, that is worth uh, summarizing. One is the communicator, right? That uh, uh, takes care of the number of tasks and the size of this, of, of this group of tasks, right? It, it group the tasks. And the other one is the key, is the key of behind the library, there are the messages, right? How, how they, what, what you need to send and receive message and, 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 and so on, right? So let's go back to send and receive uh, messages. Yes, Pranav, it's a default name, yes, sure. So, so far on our Relo, Hello World, the, the first uh, MPI program, we didn't have any message being passed, right? Uh, I think we, we put it there just for you to have the basic, the, the, the simplest possible MPI program, right? That would print on the screen several different messages that several different instances of the code generated in different compute nodes or well, on different tasks, right? Let's fix this problem now. Let's start sending tasks around. So you can go on your own and compile the first message uh, C program, right? And run with two, uh, with two tasks, ask for two tasks. Uh, the code basically, it's gonna send a message, hello, right? So basically you have to, I'm just wondering how much time I have. Oh, okay, I have half an hour, okay. Um, so basically it's sending a message, hello, from one rank to the other, okay? So basically what I'm doing, what, I'm, what it's doing here, after initializing the, the, uh, the MPI library, right? And after finding out what is the size of the communicator, in this case, it's gonna be two, right? Then each instance of this program, remember that when you run with SRAM, you're gonna run this, the same piece of code that you're seeing on my screen here twice, right? And uh, one of them is gonna be labeled, labeled rank zero, and the other one is gonna be labeled rank one, right? So, and I tell each of these codes, the MPI library tells each of these codes, uh, which, which is which, through this MPI com word. And the code itself learns which is which and the size of the com of the communicator by calling, uh, by, by these calling functions. Now, what do I do with that information, right? So I need to branch, I need to have a condition, right? If I am ranked zero, usually called the root process and the root task, I wanna send, uh, a message to the process of rank one. However, if I'm here and I'm running this code and I happen to be the process uh, with the rank one, so I'm gonna branch here and I wanna receive the message from rank zero, okay? So MPI send is gonna send the message. So this is a buffer. Uh, an array, right, of characters, he send a message, of six MPI car. Uh, this is the MPI type for characters. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and the new character in C, so six. And I'm sending that to the send to, so that's the destination. And I, I tagged the, the message with one, it doesn't matter. And I'm telling uh, that the send true 
what the send to means inside this communicator. And then I say, okay, I send a message to uh, the, the rank zero is sending a message to send to, to rank one. And here on the rank one, you're gonna use MPI receive function call, get the message is gonna be where you're gonna receive and put and, and save the message, the buffer. It's an array of character of length six. You're receiving at most six copies of MPI character from the receive from, so from the, the, the rank zero, keeping the, the same tag, same communicator, and you have a, a, a receive status object that has some information about which process that actually sent the, the message and what it was the actual size of the message. We're not gonna need on this example, but it is just there. And then I print that I got the message. So basically this is a simple send and receive program. The Fortran version is here. I don't think I have time to go over the Fortran. I'll leave it. And just to summarize um, how it is the, the prototype, the function prototype for the send function, you have a send pointer. Uh, there is a pointer to the, to the array, to, a pointer to, to the buffer, a count, that is the number of elements and the type of the elements and PI type. And this is the destination, the rank of the destination where you're sending message to and a tag to help you to identify the message and a communicator that usually is the, is the default, the global one. And the receive is the same thing, a pointer to the receiver above should be different, okay? One from the other, otherwise you have unexpected errors. A maximum count of MPI type receiving from the source, the tag must be the same, communicator must be the same, and a status object if you wanna inspect further what happened. Same idea for Fortran, but now you have the error message as well here. Let's go for a more complicated example. You wanna, we wanna send a message to the right. So the process zero sent to the one and one sent to the two. Uh, to, help, uh, um, to help with that, uh, it's useful to, to know that there are some special um, kind of source and destinations. The first one is the MPI proc no that basically ignores the, the, the operation and that helps to write a cleaner code, right? And the second one is the MPI end source. There is a wild card that, is, uh, that you can apply on the receiving side. It matches any source when we are receiving a message. So send right and receive left. So how it is the code? I'm gonna, you, you have the ranks, right? Uh, initialize, call the ranks and size, and then you compute which one is your, your rank on the left. And if the left one is, is smaller than zero, so you basically ignore the, the, the operation. If the right, rank plus one, if the right is greater than size, greater or equal than size, then you don't send anything to the right, you ignore the operation. And the message that I'm sending is the, it's my rank squared, the message that I'm receiving is just an ugly number just to, to make sure that I receive something or not. If I don't receive something, they're gonna see that this number there. And then I type send, message to be sent, one double to the right, and I receive, message to be received, one double to the left. And here I just, uh, yes, I just show the, the, the rank and then I sent, what, what is the message sent and what a message that I got and finalize, okay? If I run this command, I'm gonna have that uh, the process one and, and two, the tasks one and two will send four and got one, four, one and got zero will be sent correctly, but the task zero will send zero and got the number that I, we set there before. So it's not gonna receive anything there, okay? Because that's the number that I, I put it there first. If I run with the uh, uh, even number of, of, uh, of, of tasks, I have the same problem. So how do we fix this code? 
we can start by thinking of, okay, how can I do this? I can use periodic condition instead, right? So instead of uh, 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 using MPI proc no, I could use the following. When the left is, is smaller than zero, I use size minus one. So I get the, the, the last task. And when the, 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 the right, the, the, the task on the right is greater than size, I type, I, I set the right equals to zero, right? So what happened if I do this? Uh, the process is just gonna hang in there, doing nothing, okay? So this is a classic uh, parallel bug, it's called deadlock. It is occurs when a cycle of tasks are waiting for the others to finish. And whenever you have a close, a close cycle, you likely have a deadlock, most probably. And here, all the processes are just waiting uh, for send to complete, but no one is receiving, right? So that's a, when you have this, uh, this, this uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. Periodic boundary conditions, you, you basically and got yourself into this deadlock. Nobody is, re is receiving. So how do we get out of this deadlock? All sends and receives must be paired at the time of the sending. Okay, so what does that mean? What does it mean to be paired? It means that when one rank is sending, so it's calling a function to send, the other rank that is receiving must be at the same time calling a function to receive. So that's what it means to be paired, okay? So one way to fix this deadlock uh, without uh, any new MPI routine is by uh, breaking the, the steps into even and odd. So you start by saying that oh, the even start sending and the odds receiving, and then you uh, invert the odds send and the evens receive, okay? So that way you, you break the deadlock. So here, a question for you guys to think later. Will this work with an odd number of processes? How about two and one? Wednesday, we think about this a little bit more. Okay, so here, a solution. If the rank is, uh, if the module of rank in two, so it's, if it is even, right? Then the even is ascending and the odds are gonna be receiving. So this line here is paired with this, because if I'm, if I'm an even task, I come on this branch and, and, read, and, and execute this line. But if I'm an odd task, I come to this branch and execute this line. So this send is paired with this receive. Once that is done, then I go to the next line and I wait for receive, and then the odd one is gonna be sending, okay? Questions about this? Okay. So, and now if I run this uh, fixed code, the fourth message.c. I can see that all the all of them send the right ones and get the right the, the right numbers from the neighbor. Okay. Of course, uh, MPI realized that this was troublesome, and they create a a function called the MPI send receive that is a blocking function, right? And so it will return only after the message uh, has been received, right? That in that function automatically pairs your sends and receive. So you can put them together. Another question for you to think about why two sets of tags, types, and counts? We can come back on that on Wednesday as well. Take notes and come back on Wednesday. So basically the code becomes MPI send receive, the send buffer, the, the pointer to send buffer, one double to the right, and receive one double, at most one double from the left the same tags in the same communicator, okay? If you do the execution, now you have without a problem. 
So one of the reasons that uh, the MPI library is so big is because for each concept, usually you have different versions of the, of the same function, right? But the functions doing is slightly different, different uh, uh, behaving in a slightly different way. For example, the standard, the synchronous send is the one that we are using here, is guaranteed to be synchronous, right? The routine will not return uh, to, the, to, the, to the function, to the, to, the, to the program that is calling it until the receiver has picked up the message, okay? There are other kind of sends, for example, the, the buffered send, it is guaranteed to be asynchronous. So basically you send the message and return the, return the execution con, uh, control to the program. Uh, uh, so the system copies that data into a buffer and sends when, when it's available, when it's, when, when it's appropriate. So that some, some, some workflow uh, works well with this but it can fail if the buffer is full. So it's a little bit dangerous, right? And then you have the initial one, the, the first one that is MPI send, that is a standard send that may be implemented either synchronous or asynchronous send. And it caused a lot of confusion on the, on the beginning uh, because usually the implementers uh, would be free to implement this as they wish. And, and, and for a small messages, it would be, uh, asynchronous for big messages be synchronous, so you'd not know why your code is that lo locking and so on. So don't use the standard send. Uh, let's keep a um, let's keep using the standard synchronous send or the send receive together. Okay. <clears throat> Collectives. Oh boy. Uh, okay, let's go on collectives quickly. A, 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 and then we introduce the problem that I want you guys to work and then we revisit the problem on Wednesday because I'm gonna have to rush a little bit, okay? So, so far what we have done was uh, communications between two tasks, right? Two processes, right? However, so, some problems you, you want to, you want to, uh, the communication to involve all the processes, right? What are kind of examples of that? Let's say if you're solving an iterative um, partial differential equation, right? And then they have a, an error, right? That you you're computing on every single process, right? And so you want the process to stop only when the error is smaller than a certain threshold, right? So how do you do this? The error might be on every single process, several different point, right? Then, and then you have to reduce that data. You have to uh, compute uh, um, the mean of that error, for example, by summing up and reducing the size of the data such that you, you still have the information that you want, one number for that error, right? You could think of as well the average energy of some, of some particles, right? And or, or, or on a gas, on a diluted gas, Right, you want to compute the average memory, average energy, because uh, you want to use that average energy to compute the temperature of the system, right, and so on. So, some sometimes you have these problems that you have to to uh, you have a data spread over several different nodes, right, and you need to reduce the size of data to one number that is still uh, have some basic information about that data, right? For example, in this example here is like the minimum, the mean or the maximum, okay? So, but it could be the energy, it could be the error of the iterative procedure and so on. So how do we do this with MPI? So let's take a look here. Uh, let's say we're gonna calculate the minimum, the mean and the maximum of random numbers from minus one to one, right? So the minimum should trend to about minus one, the mean zero and the maximum one for a large number of numbers, right? So the basic naive idea would be, okay, I compute the partial results on each node and, and collect all, all to node zero, right? Let's write a MPI code for that. So basically you initialize uh, your array, the mean, mean and max, right? With some numbers. Uh, get the MPI initialization, the ranks and so on, see the, the, the random number, 
uh, make sure that each each rank starts on a different uh, in a different point on the series of the random of the pseudo random number generator, right? And then you compute the uh, an array of data uh, mapping the 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 random numbers from zero to one to minus one to one here, and then you load uh, the arrays. Uh, that you want to find the minimum, the maximum, the mean, right? By computing the minimum of the data with this number that you start with, maximum of the data with this number that you, you, you started with, right? And the mean by adding, sorry, by adding all the data and at the end divide by the number of points, okay? By the number of points. Okay, good. You computed lo locally. Now, how do I send this information to all of the other processes? Well, if I'm not the, the root process, I can just send that array that has three doubles, right? To the root process and let it, it compute the mean, the maximum, the mean. And if you are the root process, you're gonna put that, rec receive that information, this array, and then you go over each, of, each one of the tasks and then you receive, put the data there, three MPI doubles, from any source, okay? <clears throat> and then you compute uh, the global. You take the minimum of those received with the, with the ones that you have locally, the maximum, and then you add and divide by the size of, of, the, of the processes. So you have the mean, and then you print that on, on the screen. So basically, this is fine. However, it's very inefficient, right? It, requ it requires uh, the number of process minus one messages. So if you have uh, four, you're gonna need one, two, three messages to be sent to that. But if you have uh, a, a thousand or 10,000, so that number could be very big and, and the overhead be very large. And if you need to send the, the, this total back to each of them, so you need to multiply by two, right? So the time to do the communication is, is gonna be proportional to the number of processes, right? That you have running there. So very inefficient and on top of, of that, the one, just one process is gonna do this sum for you. Very inefficient. You waste time in the communication that becomes serialized in the sum. A better summing is a better way of summing that is using pairs of processes to send partial sums, right? By doing that, the maximum message received is going to be a log base two of the number of processes. And, and then if you repeat, if you send back the total back to all of them, you're going to have a, a total communication time proportional to the log of the number of processes, which is much more efficient, okay? And these kind of reductions can work for a variety of operations like a sum, product, product, min, and max. Okay. MPI collectives. Uh, uh, here we have the signature for the MPI reduce, MPI all reduce. Basically, send and receive pointers to the buffers. Count is the number of elements. MPI type is one of those so double, float, int, character, and so on. MPI op is one of the operations supported, some prod min max, for example, the communicator, and the all variants in PI all will send the result back to all process. No all sends the result just back to the root. Okay, so this is basically uh, uh, the signature of this MPI reduce that we just used there. And then you can basically use these functions to do the reduction for you. So basically you have the, yeah, so the send and receive buffers, right? So you're gonna send your local mean to the max, okay? The local max to the global max, local mean to the global mean, compute the global mean and print to the screen, okay? So the reductions are an example of collective operation. As I, as I mentioned, where all the processes uh, in the communicate must participate, and it's not just two of them. It, uh, it cannot proceed until all have participate. So you don't necessarily need to know what is under the hood, but it's convenient, it's optimized and doing the best for you. The other types of 
uh, MPI collectives. One is the broadcast that use MPI bcast. Basically, you send uh, the data from one process to all of the others, including to, to himself. The scatter that is the opposite, you get the data and partition and scatter that in different tasks. The gather collects that data that was scattered in one data, in one process. And of course, you have FireIO, barriers, and all to all. So here's the example of the broadcast that sends a, a message from one process to all the process, including itself, right? And I'm going to avoid these guys here. MPI scatter the same. It, it sends data from the root to all the processes in the group. Uh, and gather receives data from the root to all processes in the group. Okay. So the first uh, assignment is going to be this scatter, the, the gather. You're basically going to take a look on this scatter example that I have here, and you're going to copy scatter together and reverse the process. You have to send from four process and collect on the root using the MPI gather function. Okay, so this is the optional uh, assignment, and I would like you to 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 focus mainly on. Um, on what we are going to discuss, that is the scientific MPI example. However, it's uh, two o'clock and I ran out of time. Unfortunately, I think I'll have to continue on Wednesday uh, about the collective operations, just reviewing that a little bit and, and, uh, and introducing the scientific MPI example. Okay. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Let me see here. Yes, I will post the assignment uh, after class. Uh, basically, as I mentioned, this this is this uh, gather problem here is going to be the optional one with an extended uh, uh, deadline for next week. And the, the assignment that I want you to do, the, the scientific MPI example, is uh, um, due on Thursday, um, 11 55 p.m., and such that I can, I can look at the questions uh, on, I can look at the problems on Friday morning. Uh, but I have not had time to introduce the problem uh, uh, for you guys. So I will have to do that on Wednesday. I will certainly give the, the, the details. And I think if you, if you go to the last page here, the last slide, you have uh, what is the when the MPI diffusion equation that you wanted to parallelize. But I have not introduced the problem yet, so it's going to be a little bit hard for you to see it. But you, you can try, but um, yes, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I think I went too slow or too much material for one hour and a half. What other languages have good support for MPI other than C and Fortran? Well, you can wrap C++ as well. In Python, you can use NPI for Pi. And I think that's it. Yeah, I'm not sure about R, but yeah, I don't recommend uh, MPI for Python. Sorry, yes. MPI for, for Python, if you're using Python, is the best one to use, but uh, Yes, it's not high performance as you as a, a, a compiled language. Yeah, Julia probably yes. I'm not. I don't have experience with Julia. Okay. So is this the right time to stop? If you guys have more questions. Please let me know and I will go back to the 
scientific MPI example on Wednesday. And then, then I hope it is going to be clearer. Yes, there's a forum on the course website where you can post more questions through. 